because I'm. This meeting is being recorded. Ooh. I guess we made it. <laughs> I think it's working now. All right. Post captioning is enabled. Thanks for the call. Love you too. Bye bye. Fantastic. Excellent. All righty. So we'll start again with the uh, public comments. Yes. Uh, for today's meeting, we have received none. But uh, for the record, as is our general practice, we do uh, about 30 days before this meeting, we post a notice on the Revite um, grant webpage that says we are having a meeting. We provide an email address for people to send comments uh, to, and none came in uh, this time. And Dan, did you want me just to go into the current status since that's- That's um, fine, go right for it. All righty. Um, first of all, does everybody have access to the agenda? We're all good? Okay, excellent, that's good. Uh, we do, let's see. Yeah, this is um, current status in, in terms of reporting from the grantees. And uh, we have just completed uh, receiving the third round of updates that ended, uh, or they were due December 16th. We've gotten most everybody's uh, reports in. We always strive for 100% response. We, uh, we've been in the mid 90s the last two times around. It's, it's, it gets difficult to uh, follow through with everyone, but we're, it, it's always our attempt to do that. And of course our ultimate goals in soliciting these, uh, or this information is to uphold our position as stewards for the state's money, basically making sure that uh, it's continuing to be spent uh, appropriately and with a logical path toward success on behalf of the learners. Uh, so um, let me see. Um, we also try and find out if there are um, any grants that are specifically experiencing challenges that they might want some help with. Um, some of the grants in that category contact us directly anyway, regardless of, of what they put in their report. Others, the only time that we have an inkling that maybe something is happening there that is a, quite a barrier, it's in these reports. So we do take them seriously. We read every one as they come through. And anytime we see something that, oh, might be something, even if it's not a specific ask for us to help, we might discuss it among our uh, Revite team members and say, well, should we maybe give them a call and, and see how they're doing, see if we could at least be a thought partner with them to help them along. Um, as far as the bright spots and challenges that, that come up in these uh, reports, the, the uh, areas that pop up, uh, that popped up last time are usually, they, they follow what usually occurs, uh, strong partnerships and student engagement or bright spots uh, challenges, uh, they're right there. Construction costs and vehicles, change in uh, personnel and budget realignments, not really a challenge, just a, a small wrinkle that is usually overcomable. Um, now, I've also shared, because I like numbers and I like to play around with them and see what they tell us about what's actually happening, uh, I've included uh, the percentages of grants that are like three quarters of the way done as of December 16th, and we've got almost a quarter of them under the bright spots, 22% are basically done or almost there. On the other side, almost a quarter of them, 24% are zero to 25% complete. Now I took, because I like numbers and stories, I took a little bit deeper dive into those zero to 25% to see what I could see. And what I found was that, um, that's that's 12 grants out of 54 are in that um, less than 25%, which to me, and I think maybe to a lot of us would be like, well, at this stage if the grant was six or seven months to go, we would maybe hope and expect they might be a little further than that. So I took a look at their, their reports to see what's happening. For the three that are the most, um, well, in the zero to 10% complete, I found we already, we've spoken with all three of those. And they, they had different issues. And rather than blast you with paperwork, I'll just kind of read from or, or consult uh, my notes here. Uh, there were three grants that are in the zero to 10%. Um, their barriers were uh, construction cost increases, rewriting a plan after staff restructure, meaning the project director left and, and not maybe leave as complete um, in note history as might have been Support. So it was a little bit of a, a rewrite there. Right. And, and then a bus, uh, a bus uh, was, um, 12 passenger bus was delayed. 
significantly and a significant cost increase. So those three in the zero to 10%, they are, they have spoken with us. They're on their way to resolving those issues. The other nine in that category of uh, less than 25% are in, sorry about all the numbers, but this is how I break things up in my mind because I'm very detailed. The 11 to 25%, which is a little bit better. Um, that was interesting because uh, we've spoken probably to a couple of them, but all nine of them, um, or I say none of the nine had asked, had made a specific ask for us in any of their updates. And there is a specific question at the very end of the update. How can we help you? Or is there any way that, um, you know, you'd like us to uh, step in and, and chat with you? No one made a specific ask. And then further in reading the rest of their report uh, answers, none of them indicated that they felt they were in trouble. There was no cause for alarm. They, I think they generally mentioned uh, any barriers they had, but they were well underway to uh, resolve them. So they're, um, you know, we're, we're doing all that we can um, for the ones that we know have issues. And uh, as far as upcoming updates, the next one, uh, number four, which is the last regular update for this cycle, uh, will be going out uh, to the recipients in late February, <clears throat> excuse me, and it'll be due back March 31st. And then there is a final report, bigger, more comprehensive, uh, that is going to be due in September, but we're going to send that out in May to allow for more um, thought time and, and preparation time because it's, it's a, a lot of detail that we uh, that we ask for there. Okay, any questions or concerns? Okay, Dan, back to you. Thank you much, Linda. I'm going to go ahead and drop in the chat that um, link. This is one link to one data source that contains information about CT programs. So I'm going to throw that in there. You're welcome to take a look at it. It is germane to our broader conversation, so I have no problem bringing it up at this time. I'm also going to put in the, the overall page where this information is found so that you can bookmark and keep these uh, close for your use. The second one is the CTE data page and contains links to, among other things, um, the approved programs list, public reports, details, and summary historical uh, CTE programs that we've had around the state because we have programs that come and programs that go and new programs that are invented and programs that get shuttered for a variety of reasons. So this is another set of links that would be interesting to you. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop this in there as well. But to you know, answer the question about William Lord, uh, by using the handy dandy tool that uh, is available on this page. We have personal personal care services, automotive manufacturing available at Lord. And when you take a closer look at the information that's provided in the detail, look, it tells, it describes what classes are being offered and, and gets into you know, more than a degree. And this is possible for literally any high school in the state, uh, regardless of you know status, size, virtual, on ground, bricks and mortar, what have you. Anybody that's in there is is listed here, and it's very. It's a new and improved list. The old one was was usually pretty complete, but it was only accurate for a short period of time because it was a um, it was a, basically an Excel document in the sky. And this is uh, pulling off of the data system and gives us better information. So that'll answer no, some no of those legend. questions about who's who's where. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for the link to this page. It's it is. Um, Great improvement. I, I noticed that not every class has knowledge and skill statement that just because they didn't click a box or. It could well be that. Um, I would have to pull it up and look at it to be. Oh, it's not that big a deal. Sorry. Yeah, but it's a good question. And especially in the, in the areas of manufacturing, for example, that should not really shouldn't be the case because we went through 
uh, the program uh, update process and the statewide programs of study in the area of manufacturing. That's basically, that's a ship that sailed, that work is done. If there are discrepancies or inaccuracies, then those will be picked up during the uh, periodic updates. If it's in automotive, automotive is still, if I say one ship is sailed, the other one is trying to get out of the harbor or get away from the dock because automotive, diesel, um education one other area um are currently in the process of completing the statewide program of study uh development that will result in new knowledge and skills statements for all of those areas and those will be implemented in the upcoming update so there may be some older programs that that haven't uh, click the right boxes, but everybody, as they go through the update process, will have an opportunity to, to do that. Right. It's actually the at Lord automotive service is complete, but uh, it's manufacturing that is missing. Manufacturing. There. Yeah, and that's that's good to know. I can make a little side note here on my ever present sticky notes and and um, drop an email to somebody to see what's going on with that. Dan, is there a way to search uh, where it says CTE region? I'm completely unfamiliar with these numbers. Is there a map where I can see what these numbers correspond to as far as regions? We should have that. And yes, there is. Do either of the two of you remember where that's located or should I just go ahead and search for it? I'll do a quick Google search and see if I can... It pops up real quick. There should be a network map. Oh, region one through 15? Yes. Those yeah, are CTE so regions, not workforce development regions. They're, they don't correspond, is that right? That is correct. None of the various region schemes in the states uh, correspond. I understand that there is an initiative being undertaken now to try to mush those all together so that they're the same region. Um, we'll see. But right now we have our own special regions for CTE. Further questions, comments there? Let me give you a chance to chew on it. And then I'll go into my regularly scheduled comments. Yeah, I still don't see a map. So if, if somebody happens to come across that, I'd like love to see it. Um, otherwise, this advanced search function isn't very useful unless I click through every single one of them trying to find. CT well, program. let's see if we can get you and everybody else connected with something that uh, uh, will be more helpful i know they've existed in the past yeah i've seen them before cte hub i think is what they called it cte hubs well there's tim hubs and then there's cte regions and and Maybe conveniently gonna... enough they are not the same either so <laughs> hence hence some of my personal frustrations but yeah I but think there's we'll a list of uh regional coordinators and it has their uh region number but i'm not seeing where that is either yeah, it's really getting the map that counts. Yeah, and yeah. I don't. I mean, I I don't want to hold up the meeting trying to find it, but if someone Good does question, come across it, we'll I love, one. I love we'll, to see it. Yeah, we'll get you one. Thanks. Okay, let's see here. Uh, first of all, I wanted to make a couple of comments about the um, the outstanding programs uh, mentioned up in Linda's remarks earlier. We do know some information about some others. We call and we ask and we write and we don't hear much. We do know that Woodburn has uh, undertaken structural changes within the district. Uh, they will apparently uh, and I say that because we don't have confirmation yet, will not be continuing with the grant in this cycle because of their structural changes. 
Uh, we do know that there were personnel changes and there are some structural changes being planned within the uh, Lincoln County School District and Lincoln City Schools that have an impact on that grant. Uh, that particular program, Lincoln City um, Technical High School, claimed, I believe it was around $22,000 or $24,000. They're going to be uh, effectively relinquishing control over about $84,000 in grant monies because they will not be continuing. So that's the downside because we do lose programs from time to time. One of the things that, that we talk about occasionally, but we have, we're getting better information in on is that in a given cycle, we probably utilize the reimbursement 92 to 94% of the total grant monies. So there's money that stays in the coffee can or stays on the table that is not, is not claimed. We have under a few occasions had programs that had approved program, had approved grants reach out uh, and this is um, you know connects in with Linda's comment concerning the programs that don't have have been hit by price increases and been hit by supply chain and they then reach out and ask and see if there's any way that supplementation can be done. Uh, they usually reach out on a multi-faceted basis, so it drops on a lot of people at the same time, and then we have a conversation. Marshall High School in Bend is an example of that. They were a, uh, a school that was hit by a price increase. That was the aforementioned bus situation where the cost of the vehicle went up pretty uh, dramatically. And... Uh, the decision was made to supplement them by $22,000, which with us usually using only about 92 to 94% of the budget doesn't put us in any particular danger. But now we're running into situations where we actually have programs who are stepping up and saying that they're not going to be using their money. So that gives a, um, a, a little bit different level of um, um, I won't say comfort, but it reduces the caution factor. And we note here that procurement was involved in, in um, carrying this forward. There are two other programs that are, that are running into some uh, challenges that we're currently talking with, and that's Klamath. And their shortfall is comparatively small. I think they just didn't measure correctly when they put their grant together. So their costs are a little bit higher, and it sounds like we're going to be in a probably in the ten to twelve thousand dollar range, which seems uh, manageable, and it's also within the letter and the and the spirit of what they were doing. It isn't a scope creep or a, a direction change, which is good. And Marcola had pretty much the same situation, and that's going to require some examination. We've had a conversation with the uh, the person who administers that grant, and the challenges there had to do with construction. Their thirty thousand dollar building refurb uh, was put on hold because of events near the beginning of the grant cycle, and by the time everything was said and done, their thirty thousand refurb was up to two hundred and forty thousand. Uh, there was a serious series of conversations. Uh, that number has come down. Uh, my understanding and wow. talking with the person who runs the program is it's down to about 140 and overrun. Wow. Uh, our interest is not in saying, well, you're short 140, we'll, we'll poke around and find 140. It's a, what can we do that will help a little bit here and there, understanding that we can't solve everyone's problems and that there are other avenues for funding, including um, public-private partnerships, including high school success, if it's already within their high school success plan, uh, other things of that nature. So again, the interest isn't in really solving someone's entire problem, but it's giving them uh, a little bit of assistance to deal with what's going on uh, with them. Curiously, every one of these circumstances has had something to do with our old friends, construction or vehicles. 
And I know we talked about this at a fairly good length during the last meeting and kicked around some ideas and some wonderings about what may be possible, maybe a good idea. Uh, internally, we've tried to uh, pull together some, some good thinking on this, including do we need to have, um, do we need to have memoranda of understanding that establish what uh, programs will and can do with their vehicles, with their construction situations? Uh, do we want to make sure that they have declared that their permits are in place already and that it's gone through the planning commission and that everybody is super duper happy with what they're doing as opposed to heading out for kind of a ready fire aim situation that uh, a lot of the uh, programs may engage in because they're not used to doing capital construction and they're not used to buying expensive things. So we wanted to bring these uh, elements up again. There are also two others that are asking uh, for some consideration. We're not in early stages with St. Paul, there was a note within the update that said they're seeking other funding. We're duty bound to reach back out and say, what do you mean by that? Try to get an idea of what sorts of help they may need. Vernonia was another situation that was a little odd because there was a leadership change and alluded to the fact that sometimes when people leave town, they don't leave any of the instructions behind. And so we've had, in fact, I would say no fewer than a half dozen of the grant programs that have reached out to us and said, I just took over this district or I just took over this high school and I have no idea what this is. Can you send us the grant agreement? Can you send us what we ostensibly put together when we submitted the grant? And most of those have been able to write back within a couple of weeks and say, okay, we've got things squared away. We know what to do. In one or two occasions, we've actually stood up meetings, uh, Zoom meetings, and had conversations with them about how the grant functions, how it works. It's my understanding that a large number of the people who are currently heading up schools and districts um, were not doing this work three years ago. So there's a lot of change. And it's not an excuse. It's just that's the way it is when things change quickly. And a lot of people have left positions of leadership and uh, are facing, and those those district schools are facing a real change. And uh, grant programs like Rebuy are not necessarily front and center on their minds when they go to do the work. And so we do what we can to help them understand how it works and where they can get help if we need to refer them to somebody. So I'm gonna pause right there and see if there are questions or comments. If there's more funding in the future, I can imagine striking construction and buying vehicles from the allowable request. If it's problematic, why keep trying to fund that? Dan, some of the things you alluded to. Yes. We may be able to frame in the application. Okay. And, and what I mean by that, for instance, if you have a, uh, an increase in goods, do you have an alternative plan to support that mm -hmm. on the part of the district? because I think it really makes them look into that. There aren't many grants that give you the option of adding more supplemental money. Mm -hmm. And we can do it because that's what we currently are able to do, but it's a little unique actually. I, I'm not familiar with many that allow you to do that. And, and so I think they need to think that through. And then the district, the fallback may be, if we find that our costs have escalated, either we're gonna gear down, Mm -hmm. or the district will agree to pick up the balance. Now, whether they do that in high school success or, or whatever, I, I just think we have to be careful mm -hmm. with those types of things because we're really taking opportunities away from some other folks too who may have could use those supplemental dollars somewhere. That's a good point. 
So maybe it'll help us frame it, some things in the application. Let them know that if you do have a shortfall, you need to have some other sources lined up to address mm -hmm. that. That's a good point. That could be another item that we put into uh, something we discussed at the November AC meeting in terms of a, a memorandum of understanding that applicants who were going to do a vehicle purchase or construction would need to complete. And we've got, I can jump ahead a little bit if that's okay. In the agenda not. under the, the 2.15 p.m. advanced planning, there's a link there to a draft MOU. I hope everybody can access it. It's just something that we put together um, for specifically for vehicles because I went back uh, last week and listened to the recording from November and I realized that we had said that ODE would put together such a draft for this meeting. So we put one together. Uh, it's just, as I say, it is the draft. We can add, we can also do maybe a separate one for construction. This is just an idea. This is just something to throw against the wall, see what sticks, see what it, it needs additionally. But if we were to do one, say, for uh, construction and or a vehicle purchase, we could add what Jerry has said about if you do have an increase, uh, it could be another bullet point. What is your plan B? What is your alternate? Um, funding idea if uh, if you if you know better wording than what I'm coming up with, but it, it can certainly go into a document like this so that we're covering ourselves to some degree, but also mm -hmm. uh, letting them know in a nice way that it is something that they would need to think about. Mm -hmm. And any comments or uh, construction on this uh, MOU, totally welcome. This is just a starting point. Dan, those your dogs? Ah, uh, those are the grand dogs. They oh. disturbed the squirrels on the back deck. One's one's completely deaf, and the other one starts barking. And the the one that's deaf figures out that the other one's barking, and then the, so she starts barking. So it's it keeps them amused. So I can't complain. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds a lot like me and my wife. Moving right along. <laughs> now, I would. I <laughs> uh, love you, Terry. Mm. The nature of this conversation keeps kind of looping back over itself. And I thought Meg's observation at the outset is probably one way of dealing with it. Uh, we had talked at one of the earlier meetings about, well, if we take this off the table, then, you know, it, it, it's, it, it ceases to be a, he is that. Um, it ceases to be a thing, but I still think that every one of you have made the points. Folks need to leave home with a plan A, plan B, plan C, maybe even plan D when you do a grant. I think that should apply if you're buying 3D printers, welding equipment, um, SIM mannequins, whatever. There's always the possibility that things are gonna be more expensive than you thought they were going to be or less available. So I think it sounds to me like the language makes sense if everybody else thinks the language makes sense. And then we, I was going to say a little bit earlier, it's, it's good that you're bringing up the issue around the, M, not the MOU, the, um, the RFA, because we will start working on the next one in anticipation of things working out and us actually having another round of revite. We have no idea right now. We probably won't really know about the fate of revite until Art's actually the ace here because he understands the legislative piece and the sausage making far better than I do. But my guess is we're probably not going to know how that's gonna shake out until May. May, maybe early June, which is when 
we in, in education start to become more of a thing on the on the, the horizon. But I, we just don't know. And we, we at this point are hoping and believing fervently that we will have the opportunity to continue doing this good work. But um, we are going to start the process and bring you along for the adventure of revising and updating the RFA as we start to approach a new, hopefully a new year or a new biennium. Until Governor Kochek signs the actual budget, um, which could be any they space it up any time after the session ends, we will not have a budget. However, as Dan said, May and June, we'll have an idea of this. There are other grants that are going through. For example, there's about 20 million being devoted just to dental hygiene and dental assistance. Um, some is going to be given to ODE, some to the HEC for post-secondary, some to OHA for other things that are going to resemble rebike grants in the future. Um, so there's other money coming through, some which may focus through this group and some that may not. But um, in, I would think until July, sometimes we're not going to know for sure. And I, I apologize, but I haven't looked at the OARs for a while. We may be limited in some of the things that we could do to modify grants in the OARs. I, I just haven't looked at it for a while. Um, and that may be a reason for us to look at those and see if we want to adjust any of those before our next round two. It's a good idea. So we'll put that on the list of things for us to look into and be able to report back to you when we have our next meeting uh, to be scheduled and then see where that takes us. Any other um Questions, reactions, thoughts around the, the MOU process, the scope of what one may purchase with Revite reimbursement, anything like that. This is not the last time we're going to talk about this, but. Okay, good enough. Let's see, scrolling back up, we talked about the two programs, learning walks with art. Learning walks with art. We are still looking at doing learning walks and maybe doing it on an abbreviated basis, I understand. Um, but we're not, we don't have a schedule yet. We're not really sure how this is going to work. We may be some hybrid of um, doing things either online, over the phone, or doing them in person. We really haven't, haven't gotten the go-ahead yet, as far as I know from Janelle, um, for the learning walks. I'm looking at my team members here because I haven't talked to Janelle lately on this topic, but yeah. um, we're, we're, yeah. we're, we're kind of in a holding pattern on this. In the past, way back, we didn't do learning walks. About three sessions ago, we started something called learning walks where we went into the field. We observed what was happening. Uh, we did one and uh, we did a series of two of them in the past. And they, quite frankly, were very revealing. We found out a lot of good information. We fine tuned our process, but they were expensive. Um, and they were time consuming for our staff. We sent those two members out from our team, sometimes three. Um, and if they were on the other side of the state, you can imagine what that took as far as resources away from our team for that period of time. So we're looking at this now and we have not got approval yet to do the learning walks. We would like to take a look, however, um, using a triage approach and rea realizing that there are programs that have had a little bit more difficulty for one reason or another and prioritizing the ones who have had struggles or are facing some sorts of barriers and visiting those physically um, you know as soon as possible certainly putting those on the list of, of in-person visits we also are teaming with one to two additional uh, teams within the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Assessment, and we're being encouraged to work cooperatively with them. So scheduling visits 
becomes a bit more uh, complex, but ultimately what it does is it brings more eyes and ears and minds onto the topics so that we can look at what a program is doing, how a program is progressing and where a program may need assistance. So it is part of the, the um, new evolving integrated guidance uh, phenomenon that we're, we're uh, currently using and, and will into the future use that's really going to make it possible for people to use one set of spreadsheets, one set of data, one set of information to apply for a variety of programs instead of each high school having to put in four or five or six duplicate applications that ask for exactly the same information to be able to you know, sing off the same sheet of music, make it more efficient for them. And so the bigger districts uh, are able to handle it a little bit better, but it's still a lift. But the small districts where the superintendent is also the principal, is also the wrestling coach and also drives school bus. There just isn't enough uh, person to go around to do that sort of work. And so trying to come up with a better way of doing this will help. Integrated guidance is an approach to that, and then taking those integrated guidance partners from other offices in ODE along when we go on visits will uh, contribute a better view concerning what people are wrestling with, what people are doing. So that's kind of the thinking there. Tom's got a question. I'm just curious, you know, you, know, you talk about the travel issue, et cetera. Is that something that, as an example, if something, if there was a struggling program that was trying to get off the ground with, with the grant where, you know, someone such as myself on the east side of the state could help help in that, help ODE in that process, because just due to proximity, where a person such as myself could go help in that piece and get eyes on. Yeah, I don't see why that wouldn't work, and it could apply to, to, uh, to leveraging anybody who's near a program or... I think arguably we could we could send one of us and meet with someone like you, Tom, or someone like Jerry and have hands and eyes on a program and find out what's going on and then have at another time the opportunity for a wider variety of people to see what that program is doing and see what's going on. Uh, we don't want programs to fail. You don't want them to fail. We don't want them to fail. None of that's good for learners. And it's hard for the morale at the school. So if we can figure out how to address things, better to do that. We have had pretty good luck doing telephone and Zoom consultation on things that people have been hung up on recently. And I know it's only a matter of time before it's something where we actually have to have boots on the ground in the middle of their shop or their or their uh, horticulture program to help them get past whatever it is that they're dealing with. So Tom, I think your idea is really good. And uh, if any of them uh, that are on the concern list or in your area, we'll give you a shout and we'll coordinate and figure out how to do this. And, and part of my thinking too, is kind of going back to where we, you know, like to, to kind of reaffirm what, what Jerry said, you know, maybe a part of an MOU, especially with the construction side of it. I get the vehicle piece uh, though. I, Struggle with people not knowing what the advanced cost might or might not be. Because that's, you know, I can project advanced vehicle costs and et cetera. I, I get that. But, you know, I understand just, just due to pure lack of knowledge, increased construction costs, uh, even contractors sometimes struggle with that. You know, yeah. you bring in the cost of windows for crying out loud right now and how it's hard for, uh, uh, even with our new annex here, the windows that they just now came in and they've been all on order for. Oh God! I mean, maybe for maybe almost a year. I don't know. It's just it's it's crazy what those things are happening out there. But but you know, if you use windows as an example. If I put in a bid in for windows, even though I might not get them for twelve months, um, the cost doesn't change because I put the bid in. Mm -hmm. So there's, I think it's just a lack of understanding by some school districts who just don't. And it's nothing against them. They just don't understand the cost of of how to do construction, how to put a bid in. Um, but but I you know I would hate to see. I would hate to see that process go away because what a beautiful, beautiful thing with this particular grant to see some of these construction projects uh, that mm -hmm. have happened across the state. I mean, this is, I think, you know, uh, it's unprecedented. It's just unbelievable what it, what it potentially does for uh, using your words of learning of a child. 
And uh, I'd, hate to, I'd hate to see that go away, but, but that said, some of the parameters around that, some education, uh, whether it's through ODE or some of us that maybe understand construction, just us helping however we need to help. I, I'm, I'm, I'm there to, for my small part in that, willing to help out wherever. That's phenomenal, thank you. I would, I would say to that point that Tom just made, you and I have had some conversation, maybe we've had a conversation as a group in the past. I still believe regional coordinators need to be more involved in this process. Mm -hmm. Because if you're talking about developing programs, whether it's a program of study or whether it's a, an emerging program of study, I go into 23 school districts and the 23 high schools. If I know that six of my schools are approved CTE refight programs, mm -hmm. that's a basis of conversation when I enter that school. Just say, how's it going? Do you need any help with anything? I know that there are some other RCs around that'll holler and kick and scream about adding more responsibility, uh, responsibility ability, try to say that fast. But to me, that's what we do. That's really our bread and butter is trying to help our programs grow. And so that should be right there at the front as far as I'm concerned. So I think we need to be more involved as RCs in this whole process and need to get out and talk to those schools. We can be your boots on the ground. I got some pretty doggone big boots I'd like to point out. So <laughs> I don't mind being out there. Well, just to add you know, to what Jerry's saying, as an, as an example, you know, our, our region, our, our, our CTE is, is uh, coordinator is starting new. So, okay, let's say that particular person doesn't have some expertise in a certain area. Well, lo and behold, there are other people in this region, though, that do have that expertise to help that said individual out. So, because they got to learn, too, just like we all learn as a brand new teacher or a brand new administrator or whatever. I and mean, there's tons of people, I think, if you just, sometimes you just got to ask. Uh, that's not what I've always found out. Some, you just don't know what you don't know until you just flat out ask somebody. And it's amazing uh, the good people that might come out of the woodwork on a deal like this. Well, I, I think we need to reemphasize, maybe it needs to come up every time we have a coordinator meeting or we have a group together that these are out in the ecosystem. And these are things that are happening in your area and we on the front end tried to do a pretty good job of making sure people knew what they had and where things were going. In fact, a couple of the of the high schools that ran into problems uh, ended up getting a tremendous amount of information from the RC involved who helped dig for things that we couldn't dig for and knew a better from a a better base of information what is going on uh, because there are questions that we can't ask there are questions and then there are things that we don't know but sometimes that local person much to your point jerry has a feel for what's going on on the ground and who's who the players are who who's doing what where when and why and that can be very very helpful and that helped us actually crack into one of these and learn more about it because the people involved and it's not one that's on the list it's another one um we're just not willing to talk and having that insider information made it possible for us to get more of what we need so yes i think more more touch is important and um, we can start today here's a question I was wondering if on the grant application, if the regional coordinator uh, has to sign off on it or approve it in some way or give feedback. That has, as I recall, not been the case. It's not on the application. It's not on the RFA process other than to for a signature. It is indicated in there that you need to have the following people involved in the conversation and the regional coordinator is on the list maybe getting it to the point of saying if you don't have a sign off from an rc then 
your mm-hmm. your application's not going anywhere. I'd want to kick it over to Tom from a building perspective and Jerry from a regional coordinator perspective in terms of health, exactly. not just, helpful, you know, what's going on there. I was just thinking about Jerry's suggestion that they help with the monitoring and that, that if they don't even know that they applied, that seems mm-hmm. like that would be a problem. But I like Jerry's suggestion. Mm-hmm. Tom or Jerry, you want to say anything else on that, or we pretty much said what needs to be said on there? No, I, I think we're good. You know, at, at a high school level, um, and we're, we're unique in Hermiston um, because of our relationship with the, the IMESD, we're a little bit weird. Um, but uh, you know, if I was pursuing it, and obviously my superintendent was involved, the our our uh, the uh, coordinator happens to be in house for us, and then we have a unique relationship with IMASD because of Carl Perkins. It's kind of a funky deal, um, uh, along with CP certification. That's really the only contact we have in some regards with the IMESD because of when we pulled out uh, eight, seven, eight years ago. But but I would think with these smaller schools, I would sincerely hope that the the uh, uh, regional coordinator would be at least knowledge of, I would, I would sincerely hope. Mm-hmm. As there is another piece of this that you mentioned earlier, and I maybe it tied in a little bit, you know, is, if there is money short, I am in full agreement of, you know, that uh, uh, having to understand that they have to pick up the different, the slack somewhere along that process. Uh, it's easy for me to say because as a district, we're big. <laughs> So I can find sources of money and I get it. So it's a little, more, it's a little harder for other school districts to come mm-hmm. to this. But that's where your, your regional coordinator would be pretty instrumental. I don't know that I really answered your question, though. Yeah, I think you did. Jerry, anything else? You know, one of my biggest fears with Zoom is that it doesn't freeze frame at an inappropriate time because you never know what position your face is in at the time. And so I don't run into that when I meet people in person and go into their buildings and so forth. And so, so, so I prefer to, to do that because uh, that zoom thing is not always cracked up to be what it's supposed to be. But anyway, I, I just feel strongly and Meg hit the nail right on the head Meg, I can't really tell you who all the players are in my region this go round with CTE Revite. I know several are. I know one is a good big concern of mine because of their, I think they're probably part of the zero to ten. If they're not, we'll talk mm-hmm. about that because I think they are. They uh, are. And, and I think we've got some concerns that here, here's here's the dot connection. Your regional coordinators are involved in integrated guidance. Mm -hmm. I work with ESD liaisons on integrated guidance. Mm -hmm. Two pieces of integrated guidance are Perkins and high school success, not CTE Revite. However, CTE Mm -hmm. Revite or high school success can be braided with CTE Revite. Mm -hmm. So if I'm aware of what's going on in those schools, relative to the integrated guidance piece, why should I not be in a position to help connect those dots? I don't want to be on the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. So I I want to be able to help my kids in my schools by making sure that I can provide the right support for the programs. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's got to accept it. But uh, again, and it might be that we just, I think in Eastern Oregon, it really boils down to relationships. I think it's that way everywhere, but I think over here, it's sort of an expectation in these schools. You get out and meet people, you talk to them. So let's combine some things and take some things off y'all's plate because y'all not going to get over here. Let's be real. Heck, they're not even letting you back in the dang office, it looks like. So how are we going to get you out here? So anyhow. Yeah. Jerry, I just had a thought as you were speaking of maybe a way that we could 
at least keep the regional coordinators more informed during the course of the grant. Um, because we do, as Dan alluded to, when a grant is awarded, um, we do copy in the regional coordinator. I think we actually send the um, announcement of the grant award to the regional coordinator first and then follow up with mm -hmm. a copy to the actual recipient. So the not even though um, if and I think we also send a copy, let me think here out loud. Uh, we also send a copy uh, to the regional coordinator if they have not received the grant. So maybe they weren't involved as they might have should might have been um, in the process, at least they know that there was an application and they know the, you know, what happened. But if we were to do something like uh, when we receive the updates, possibly um, it's not too um, practical to forward those on directly to you. But if we were to do something like take the uh, responses from, let's say, all of your grants for update number one, and just send you a little report so that it reminds you that it's going on. And it also, it, it'll be up to you, individual RC is to determine whether they want to step in or what have you, but at least you'll know, you'll be reminded of what's going on out there and you'll see specifically what they think their challenges and successes are. Would that, is that something you think that might help out in the process? I think you hit the nail on the head is that if you're involved I get a lot of information on a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. If I'm not involved in it, it doesn't necessarily stick. If I'm involved in the process, it sticks. I know because I've worked with them. And so I think that's that's what you're alluding to is being involved in the process versus getting information on the process. I sort of, you know, I, I guess I'm a little hands on. I apologize. No worries, Jerry. It's one of my shortcomings, but I got a lot if y'all like to hear some of them. We'll put it on the agenda for next time. Yeah, you better make it a long one. <laughs> okay, well, we'll increase the length of the meeting. Any other thoughts, suggestions, recommendations? We'll get some of these down and work with these. I think they're they're all good sound ideas that can help make things stronger, whether we end up with a big grant, a small grant or something in the middle next time around and set up people to be in a, in a more satisfactory position. I, I do sincerely think with so much churn out there and so many people who didn't think they were gonna be superintendents three months ago and now they're superintendents that there's a huge bit to chew on and uh, trying to find ways to make it easier by building a, a network of support around them is, is going to be the way to go. Okay, I think so learning walks, we pretty much talked about the future, looking at advanced planning. Other considerations and really cool things, um, Tom brought to our attention a couple of individuals that look like real high flyers and folks that can bring some other perspectives to the table uh, and wanted to submit for consideration, uh, Ryan Trivet and Aaron Duff. As we expand the board, the uh, the board, it's not a board yet, it's a committee. One of these days, it'll probably be a board, but I think we have to ask someone before they'll let us turn it into a board. Um, and this is not the end of this. We talked in our, our previous meeting about when you find someone who is a, is a friend to CTE, a friend to learner success, uh, who would be an interesting fit for the group that uh, feel free to go ahead and suggest them. And in a moment here, I'm gonna ask Tom to just say a couple things about each of these individuals. Uh, we talked about them, uh, I think it was probably just before, before the big holiday thing or right in there. And it sounded pretty good to us, but 
I'd like him to spend a couple moments talking about each of them and then see if the larger group is comfortable and if all is as it should be or as it will be, then uh, what we'll do is the next time we have a meeting, which I'm guessing will probably go out about 60 days because we'll want to start thinking about the end of the grant cycle and talking about writing the RFA and so forth. Uh, that we'll be able to have any new folks join us, uh, not necessarily as voting members yet, because as I understand our, our charter and the way we work, they really come on in the fall. But so good to have people coming and learning alongside those who were experienced and to see how the process works versus being sort of dropped in the middle of things in fall and, and being expected to come up to speed immediately. So a little bit more civilized way of, of welcoming people aboard. So I'll stop going on and I'll give Tom a little bit of space to talk now. And then uh, we will wind down toward the end of our agenda. Tom, take it away. Thanks, thanks Dan. Uh, so I'll, I'll first speak about uh, Aaron Duff. Aaron Duff is a former PT instructor, uh, taught agriculture for I don't know how many years, but for several years, he's in Eastern Oregon. Uh, he's not a kid anymore, but I refer to him as a kid. Uh, um, uh, out of Milton Freewater, Athena area. Um, he, played, uh, he taught agriculture out in Milton Freewater, and then he uh, worked his way through administration. I, think he, well, I know he was an elementary principal for a period of time, and then some changes happened in Milton Freewater, and lo and behold, he, he became superintendent, I think, just prior to COVID. So you talk about a steep learning curve. Um, but but Aaron, Aaron Depp, I've known him for a long, long time. Um, knew him to some degree when he was actually an, an, a kid in FFA uh, because he was in the same region as, as myself. Uh, and then he was also a student teacher for me when I was still an ag teacher. So. I had a chance to to mentor him during that time frame, which was well over 16 years ago, I guess you could say. So it's been it's been a while, but Aaron Duff is uh, just uh, you know as far as uh, I'm concerned, you know, because I've known him now for uh, 18, 19, 20 years, is, is just a good all around guy. Understands education and and has, and has worked at multiple levels, which I think gives him a little bit of that balance. Uh, and then, and then, just another possible representative from this side of the state uh, uh, that I'm aware of, and, and and I haven't said anything to him at all. I don't believe in the way. I don't know if Dan, you did or not, but um, of course, my screen says you're dancing to my my talking Dan, so I, I don't know what that means. But maybe I'm either entertaining you or something. But uh, <laughs> uh, then uh, with Ryan Trivet, I obviously don't know Ryan Trivet real, real well, but I have been involved with him and his company off and on now for several years. Uh, as a school district, we use PacWest Lobby Group to help uh, ran, run our bond campaign this last go around. Uh, I also know that he's worked with other people in the political realm uh, to either get them elected, i.e., um, I think he worked on uh, a county commissioner's bond, or not bond, but his election campaign several years ago. Uh, he's worked on others as well. He's closely associated at one time, I think, with Representative Smith, um, though at what level, I don't know. Um, the, the recent the recent thing that kind of really, I guess, brought him to light as maybe a possible candidate for this committee is, is, is his involvement in education from the standpoint of he was, or PacWest, I should say, his company was a player, some form or fashion, uh, with the passage of that bill um, for that apprentice, the pre-apprenticeship program for heavy construction, where this region will benefit uh, as we put in a, 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 a pre-apprenticeship program for heavy construction out at the old Army Depot. I don't know why I'm pointing that direction because you guys don't know which direction this is where I'm sitting at, but it's point it's the direction my thumb is pointing. <laughs> so um, uh, that way. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, and 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 Pac West was a major player, and and someone else there can correct me. I don't have the numbers. It's the IBW, I think seven hundred one, I think out of Portland. Uh, and someone can correct me later if I said that all wrong. But they're the piece that's involved with us to try to get this started for this region. 
Cumberson School District was a recipient of the dollars in some form or fashion, maybe just because we have the ability to do it, but I don't think it applies to just Cumberson High School per se. I mean, I think it applies to this area. And what that's going to look like going down the road obviously remains to be seen as we work through the logistics of getting, uh, or other lots of other individuals work through the logistics of getting that whole property uh, up and off the ground, so to speak, because there's all kinds of facets to it that are way beyond my scope. But the point is, is that PAC West was a major piece in getting that legislation passed uh, to get those dollars sent out here to start that program. And so, and, and we as a district are the, the main player on now how to, the boots on the ground, how to make it work. But so they are, they are very, very supportive of education in, in that light. Uh, you know, but as far as where they're housed, I, I think PAC West home office, they have an office here in Hermiston too, but their head office is actually right in Salem, I believe. Uh, so, so that's kind of my my my, my uh, dealings with Ryan, uh, you know, as the owner, and and that's been limited. Um, mostly, I deal with one of the other gentlemen that uh, works for him. Uh, Ryan, in this case, I did. I think I told Dan this uh, uh, some time ago. I did reach out to Ryan. To see if this is something that he was interested in. I didn't make any promises. That's not my place, but mm -hmm. um, and he, he was interested. Aaron, I don't believe I don't believe I ever said anything to Aaron. I think I stopped once I gave that information to you, Dan. I think he came in there as well. I can't remember, but but uh, anyway, that's that's kind of where we're at with both those both those individuals. Good. Thank you, Tom. They, they sound like they would bring some valuable um perspectives to the group if the group sound feels like this sounds like the type of additional representation that would be of value then we can go forward with you know formally asking them to become part of the group and one way or the other uh Every one of you knows at least a few people who may have some unique skills and abilities and perspectives that would help us as we continue to refine and build out that thing known as Revite. And you can at any time recommend or suggest that somebody become part of the uh, part of the group. So questions, comments, concerns with anything you've heard at this point? No, do you need a motion from us to? Oh, let's go ahead and do that. Yeah, do a little part of the crow here. <laughs> I move that we accept the recommendation to offer committee chair uh, committee membership seats, I guess, uh, to Aaron Duff and Ryan Trivet. Second. Discussion. Hearing none, all those. Oh, okay. Hearing none, all those in favor. Aye. All those opposed? Abstentions? Motion appeared to carry. We will contact them and then we will get back to you and uh, let you know the good news. Also, we're gonna try to run down a region map. There used to be several copies of the CTE region map floating around. So uh, I know we have the list of regional coordinators. Thank you, Meg, for dropping that in the chat. But there are, um, since those borders haven't changed in I think practically forever, if I can find an older map or one of us on our side can find an older map, we'll get it out to you and uh, give you an idea of, of uh, where the regions are. And I can't remember whether Jerry has the largest region or the second largest region. It seems to me like you have the largest region. You're number one. <laughs> Just remember Jerry is number one. There we go. 33,000 square miles. 
Now that's a ding dang deal. <laughs> that is a lot. Yeah, it's a little bit of travel. And I think you have the largest number of single A high schools in your region. Correct. In the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Pretty and wide open and wow. Well, in 33,000 square miles, 23 school districts, nine through 12, there are about 2,000 kids. So you can tell that when you have schools in your area that have that many in one high school, mm -hmm. that's, yeah, so you can tell we're, we're spread out. And, and like you said, a lot of them are 1A schools. It also are there one B schools in Oregon. What's that, Meg? Are there one B schools? No, there used to be prior to reclassification years ago. It used to be what was called the B League, and B schools were all the one A schools. Then they went one A through six A classifications. Uh, Tom's school at one time was a five A, for example. I assume it still is, but I don't know how that looks compared in Washington stuff. But uh, and so we were five A in in Oregon. Uh, we would be pushing probably at six A now. I, I forget what the cutoff is. They changed it every five years. They reclassify it. Um, but we are a three A in Wash what three A in Washington, and and I grew up in a B school. <laughs> Pretty Me city too. B school, so I'm familiar with all both spectrum. <laughs> mm -hmm. B schools have an existence for. What, Jerry, 20, 20 years? 20 yeah. You're calling us old? I'm calling myself old. I started in a B school as a teacher and a coach. The Huntington Locomotives. Ooh. Choo choo. That's it. <laughs> right there, I couldn't resist. Right there with the time changes. Yep. Well, folks, a pleasure as always. We'll um, get back to you with the items in our list. Um, 60 days out would put us around the first part of April. I'm wondering if we want to uh, do another maybe hour, hour and a half long meeting and start um, delving into RFA and uh, also talk about um, learning walks and their status and their progression. Is that feeling okay? I see a lot of people nodding yes. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's good to see you more more often and less often. So I would like to do that if it works. And in this time of day pretty much works for most. Any given week. Yeah, Dan, can we just stay off that first week in April? We can, uh, oh, yeah, because that's the first week back, isn't it? Well, <laughs> for selfish reasons, because we play in Washington at the athletic schedule. That's oh, that's right. <laughs> well, I'm wondering what today's Wednesday, right? Um, April 12th? O-A-C-T-E. Oh, yes. I guess unless we decide to meet at Oregon, ACT, we probably don't want to do that. Jerry likes that idea. Bridget, you come in? Be busy teaching our pre-apprenticeship. <laughs> it's the 19th floor, go the next Wednesday. Just do it. Yep, let's go ahead and nail that one down. Okay. For the 19th? 19th of April, 1 p.m. Thank you. That'll do her. So we'll look forward to seeing you all uh, 19th of April, 1 p.m. You'll get contact information and Zoom links and other fun stuff. And we'll talk to you then. Thank Great. You. I think that gets us past conference season too. Yeah, I think so. It gets us. Because like, isn't skills like the 12th or something? I think that's the last one. So. Yes, before I have to start worrying about. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep. This will. Okay. Dan, 
Thanks very much, everybody. Right. Thank you. You bet. Bye. Jerry, you're... Well, 